um, in the history department. So I, I come at your prayers. I ask you particularly at this time. Um, last night the lecture was about love in Islam, uh, the halakha. When you're talking about these things right now in the public eye, it is very, very tough. As a matter of fact, it feels tougher to me. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or, uh, or what, but it feels tougher to me than it feels when I look at the churches after 9-11. So I ask you to pray for me. I, I covet that's not open to the public. It is in a professor's class, so it's, it's private to those students in that class. But I really ask you to pray for me because I, I present the facts. I talk about the Bell Formation and I talk about the political bedfellows um, of the United States and what ISIS really stands for and not what Fox and CNN is saying. So people that hear me in my lectures, and as a matter of fact, I, I went to this class last semester and the professor was uh, so happy about what he heard that he is inviting me to come and lecture again. So, um, December the 9th. And that's December the 9th. So, yes. So, please pray for me. I, I beg you to pray for me because um, I do find some of the lecturing that I'm feeling more and more difficult under the current situation with uh, people that are running for the presidency and making statements like all Muslims should wear a badge and that kind of thing. It is created. Is yes, more challenging. Did you have your hand up? I just want to know what day we be at UCF. Um, it's, I think, December the 12th or 13th, but it no, is open. It's December the 9th. December the 9th, but it isn't open. It's only for those people in that class. So I do covet your prayers. Um, these lectures are really what ISLM is all about, getting out and building bridges. And I wanted to read to you a um, text message that I got from a church that we've been working with for seven years. Um, and Noran's going to bring that to me now. Um, she's going to get it up. I, I want you to hear what people say about what we do. Um, because oftentimes you come to class and you hear, well, the Imam Sight spoke here, he spoke here, he spoke there. But you don't really get the gravity of what it means to these people. So, it was an email, I'm sorry, and it said, Pastor Jen. Now, Pastor Jen is the, she's not a Jen, she is the executive <laughs> preacher, pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church. And uh, when I first started speaking there, she was the second in command there. Um, Bill Barnes, who was the senior pastor, has now retired, but he still works for the church. She is now in his position. Pastor Jen, and I wanted to reach out to both of you and let you know you are in our thoughts and prayers at this time when so much hate and misinformation is being spewed out in the world. Little did I know when I answered my phone a little over seven years ago that not only would we find the missing speaker for our focusing on the real issues panel, but we would also get the most amazing life-affirming friendship. Thank you for reaching out to us first and for trusting us. We are incredibly grateful for your strong witness in sharing peace and understanding in our community. We sincerely hope that the work we have done over these last seven years has truly built a bridge of hope so that our faith communities are sharing a different message than the ones we see and hear on social media and cable news. In this time of thanksgiving for our country, we are grateful for you. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for teaching us so much. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for being honorary St. Lucas. Blessings to you and your family. So when a church sends you that kind of email, you know that you're making a difference. You're doing it all. You're letting people know about the true and peaceful message of Islam. And just, you know, in speaking of that, this will be the sixth time that I've been in the pulpit of this church right here. So when you support this organization, it's a 501c3, your donation is tax deductible. That's what you're supporting. Because believe me, I have to eat. I have to feed my family. And so I can't tell you how much I appreciate 
everybody's contribution so that we can do this and get these kind of emails. Um, last week I received a thank you note from a professor talking about how he is so grateful for the bridges that are being built in his class. And we received another uh, card from an organization where I made a speech about the effects of environmental discord and how Islam was the first green religion. And that was made in downtown Orlando. So we get thanked for this and people are being enlightened about the true and peaceful message of Islam. So we'll move on now to the subject matter of today's class, which is from Surah al-Baqra, uh, second chapter of the Holy Quran and verse 154. This is perhaps one of the most misunderstood verses in the world today. It is a verse that has caused Orientalist, um, Muslims, non-Muslims, jihadists, extremists, radicals to misinform the rest of the world about Islam. And so you may feel that I am overloading you with information. And let me say to you that I understand that those people who are really good at PowerPoint, they simply put bullets up there. And I recognize that almost my entire speech is up there. And that is not the ideal way to work with PowerPoint. However, because of my stroke, I literally don't have the time to do my speech and then separate, a, separate it out and give you the bullet point. So I encourage you to bring your notebook and to make your own notes and to pull out what is the bullet point from the PowerPoint. And I wish that I could do better. Um, so I ask you to pray for me that Allah will continue to help me. But it does take me typically anywhere from 10 to 15 hours to prepare this hour and a half lecture. So I ask you to, to pray for me. So the verse says, And say not of those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead. Nay, they are living, though you perceive it not. A very provocative verse, isn't it? It is often taken out of context. And I have to begin by saying there were no suicide bombers in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There was nothing akin to that in the early days of Islam. Surah 4, verse 29, and this is just part of the verse, says, Nor kill or destroy yourself. Surah 2, verse 195, says, And do not throw yourselves in destruction. Folks, you really do need to have this information. I beg you to make notes and make it your own so that whenever you are doing da'wah out there, you are able to tell people this. This is very, very important in the current time that we're living in, this era. When we look at the highest authority in Islam, the Quran, we find nothing in it endorsing rewards for suicide. Instead, we find the strongest condemnation with severe punishment for those who commit suicide. We find nothing in the authentic Bukhari and Muslim of the Ahadith endorsing suicide. Instead, we find strong condemnation for it. Jundab narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, said a man was inflicted with wounds and he committed suicide. And so Allah said, my slave has caused death on himself hurriedly, so I forbid paradise for him. So when someone consciously commits suicide, paradise is forbidden for them. Now what I want to say to that is, Allahu A'lam, if someone who is insane commits suicide, it is not the same ruling. Because the insane are not even required to pray. So we have to be very careful when we throw out blanket statements and say everybody that commits suicide is going to hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's very, very important for us to understand that, the difference. Thabit bin Adaha narrated that if somebody commits suicide with anything in this world, he will be tortured with that very thing on the day of resurrection. So people that, pardon me, blow their brains out, then they will be tortured with whatever they used on the Day of Judgment. This is according to authentic Hadith. 
Now, where did the reward of the 72 virgins in paradise for suicide come from? And how many of you have been asked that question? How many of you had the answer? Today you'll have the answer. Are there any Islamic teachings we can point to endorsing that? We find nothing in the higher authority of Islam, the Quran. We find nothing in it endorsing rewards for suicide. Actually, we find <coughs> the strongest condemnation with severe punishments for those who commit suicide. When we look at the Ahadith, the second in authority in Islam, we find nothing in the authentic Bukhari and Muslim Ahadith endorsing suicide. Now, if you search something called Ghayrib Ahadith, which is similar to Da'if, it's weak, unauthenticated, or strange Ahadith, what would make an Ahadith strange? It goes against the Quran. Very good. You got the bonus points today, team. It goes against the Quran. Anything that the Quran says, if you read a Hadith that says the opposite, then that Hadith has been fabricated. <coughs> Or it is da'if, it is not reliable. Searching what Muslims refer to as Ghayrib Ahadith, weak or strange hadith, we do find something about 72 wives, but not virgins. The hadith we find is the following. In Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Hadith 2562 says, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was heard saying the smallest reward for the people of paradise is an abode where there are 80,000 servants and 72 wives, over which stands a dome decorated with pearls, aquamarine, and ruby, as wide as the distance from al Jabiya, a Damascus suburb, to Sana'a, which is Yemen. This is a weak hadith that has no sanad, and a sanad is the chain of transmission. So when we have a healthy hadith, we have a train of transmission that goes from the last person all the way back to the first person that reported it. This hadith does not have a strong isnad. We always reject a hadith that contradict the Quran. Even if the hadith was true, there is nothing about it that says that if someone commits suicide, they would get 72 virgins. Okay? So I want you to hear this closely. So that when people talk to you about this, you can say, yes, there is something called a hadith, but it's not authenticated. It is not recognized by the scholars, and it doesn't say virgins. It talks about wives. <laughs> Muslims know that the description of paradise and ahadith and Quran is allegorical. That helps us relate to paradise. If not, then Allah would have allowed us to take our bodies with us when we die. So let's process this a minute. What is going to paradise? The ruh, the soul. Does the soul have hands and legs and eyes and ears? No. So then what on the earth would you do with the virgins? Anyway. You understand what I'm saying? That which you would use if you had 72 virgins will have been decayed in the grave. It will not be in paradise. And, and you need to tell people this, folks. When people are listening to Fox and CNN and they are being erroneously educated about Islam, make them think. Say, ask them, in your faith, are you going to take your body to paradise? They're going to immediately say no. So then, what are you going to do with those virgins? Even if they existed, which we know that they don't. Fox. The vehicle by which we can enjoy the physical things, especially 72 virgins, mentioned as being in heaven, is left behind here in this world to rot and decay away. So we know for a fact that for heavenly rewards, physical things of this world are used to describe things totally non-physical. Hadith, to keep in mind, is as follows. Did you want to say something? Fox. It's Fox News who is killing people. Yes. Fox News is misinforming people. They hate. Yes. 
The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Nobody who dies and finds good from Allah in the hereafter would wish to come back to this world even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it. Except the martyr who, on seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would like to come back to the world and get killed again in the cause of Allah. Now I want to break this down because it requires a little breaking down, I think. Because the word martyrdom has been murdered. The martyrs of the world predominantly are murderers, and the word in its true meaning in Arabic and Islam has been murdered. 72 physical virgins are a small part of the whole world to be given to someone who has experienced paradise to come back to. Imagine, I go to paradise and I want to come back to the world for 72 virgins. How small then would paradise be? And we know that paradise is a part of the unseen. It is beyond the understanding of mankind. You cannot <laughs> contemplate paradise. You can ponder and reflect, but there's no way that we can actually really know just how wonderful paradise will be. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said nobody who experiences paradise would want to come back to this world even for everything this world has to offer. So why would somebody want to die in this world so that they could get 72 virgins which they won't have a body to do anything with? If a man was getting 72 physical virgins in heaven, then surely he would get more than that from the world and would be enticed to come back. I'm just trying to get you to think, folks. When you make dawah, you need to be equipped with this kind of argument. On the other hand, martyrdom in war for an Islamic cause is praised extensively as in the above hadith. But let's clearly define that, and that's what I will endeavor to do today. In Surah 3, verse 169, do not consider those killed while engaging in Allah's cause dead. Rather, they live with their Lord who sustains them. Are they living with their Lord in a physical body? No. The Quranic idiom killed while engaging in, a, in Allah's cause is a reference to martyrdom for acting on being a Muslim, whether as a persecuted and powerless individual or as a warrior fighting in defense of Islam country, justice, freedom, and peace. A hadith in Sunan al tirmidhi states that in contrast to the suicide, the martyr does not even feel the pain of his death. That's wrong. No, that's right. Oh, it's right. Yes, a martyr does not feel the pain of their death according to authentic a hadith. Okay? But anybody here that commits suicide, if you take a gun and blow your brains out, or you drive into a wall, how many people believe you're going to feel that? Now even today, we had a class at 10 o'clock talking about Janazah prayers. We actually know that you feel what's going on with your body. You actually hear what's going on when people are praising Allah around you as a corpse. Which is why you're not allowed to cry. This is why you're not allowed excessive weeping, which we talked about at the 10 o'clock class, because it disturbs the, the dead. He is also forgiven of all his sins and has the right to intercede on behalf of his own family to enter heaven. You won't have that right as a person who commits suicide if you have your right mind. Do you see that you can't say that a martyr is a person who commits suicide for a law? But according to Fox and CNN, what do you think is predominantly being promoted in the world today? What I hear, and what I hear when I go to college, is that people now think this is synonymous because of the rubbish that propagandists have promoted in this country and the world. I want to make sure that according to the Quran, the first authoritative source, and the Hadith, the second authoritative source, that you know and understand the difference. And there's so much to be said about this that I'll be lecturing about this 
the very next Sunday we meet as well, inshallah. Because I want to make sure that you have sufficient information to argue with beautiful words and eloquent speech when you talk about this. So suicide is forbidden. Killing of non-combatants is forbidden. But martyrdom is rewarded with entrance into heaven and heaven and therefore with great material rewards in the world to come. Islam's position on suicide is not a secret. It is common knowledge, well known, and can easily be discerned by anyone doing a very elementary study of the religion. I think I gave you the basics that you can see very clearly. Yet what we have today is this knee-jerk, unconscious association of the religion of Islam with suicide bombings. Even to the point where claims of getting 72 virgins are an Islamic prize offered for suicide. You can get on Sheikh Google, and this is why I warned my new students about Sheikh Google. You can get on Sheikh Google and find so-called people self-proclaimed and proclaimed by others as scholars that will teach you something wrong about Islam. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, all you've got to do is watch the news clips and you will hear these so-called jihadists saying Allahu Akbar when they murder someone. <coughs> This is pure ignorance. This is a cruel and ugly lie about Islam that has so widely perpetuated that it is accepted as fact. It is so accepted as fact that people will say something to you out of their anger because they believe that. And it is our responsibility to correct their, their misguided belief. Corrections to the association of Islam with suicide and the killing of innocents are not made in the media. If I go and tell any kind of newscaster, newscaster, I have to speak American English, I slip up occasionally, that what you said was not correct, how many believe they're going to go on the next newscast and correct it? No, because that's not sensational. That doesn't sell. Does it get ratings? Instead, it is glued even tighter by reporting that not a person disobeying Islam, but a person imbued with Islamic religious fervor committed a suicide. These people are painted in the media almost like charismatic Muslims. Do you, do you relate to what I'm saying? Is it resonating with you? I'm, my body language is a little strange today. What are you feeling about what I'm saying? Are you struggling or, or am I just misreading it because it's not very light? You're getting ready, right? I'm getting red? Yeah. No, I'm just red anyway. That's, I'm a red man. <laughs> well, you know, I have to say there's hadith about the Prophet Muhammad saw so him turning red when he would talk. I'm very emotional about this because my religion is being hijacked by people's lives. And it's being hijacked by people that call themselves Muslims because of their ignorance. And so they say and they actually believe this stuff. I'm talking about people that were born Muslim in a Muslim family, were all born Muslim, but they actually raised in a Muslim family that actually believe this rubbish. They buy into it and they actually think it. I've had people come and try to teach me this stuff. So, I'm, yes, I guess I do get emotional. Pray for me. We have a media that is too eager to enlighten and spread the word about ignorant Muslims killing themselves for 72 virgins. We read and hear every day about suicide bombers killing themselves and others with them. Are we to believe that a religion that strongly condemns suicide, promises severe punishment in hell for those who commit it, 
and has never had a strategy for using suicide to fight wars until recent contact with the Israelis predominantly, somehow has spawned the most suicide killers on earth. We have to go back and study the history of Islam and recognize that this is a new phenomenon of Buddha, so to speak. Muslim scholars declare that terrorists are mass murderers, yeah. not martyrs. And that's exactly what they are. Martyrdom, terrorist attacks, hijackings, and bombings are inspired by men who teach that violent acts can pave the way to paradise. <coughs> Islam is a religion of peace, not the religion of violence. None of our actions involve violence. These attackers are enemies of Islam, not martyrs, but mass murderers, pure and simple. The hysteria and the fear that these acts bring are the antithesis of what Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came to bring. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came as a mercy to mankind, not as a murderer to mankind, not as a bomber to mankind. Suicide is forbidden. Killing of non-combatants is forbidden. But martyrdom, only for the sake of establishing peace, is rewarded with entrance into paradise. Martyrdom for the establishment of peace. Martyrdom for the establishment of peace. Why did the Prophet Muhammad migrate from Mecca to Medina? To establish a peaceful Islamic state. Not to have war, and for 13 of 22 years, and I think I, I'm right there, 13 of 22 years of his mission, he avoided war. Religious zealots of any creed are defeated people who lash out in desperation and do horrific things. And we see that in the Ku Klux Klan. We saw that in the Crusades. We see that in Irish Catholics that blow up abortion clinics and kill abortion doctors. No Christian would like for us to say that that is the action of a Christian. These people are very sick and their actions cannot be seen as acts done for the love of Allah. This is politics and there is no Islamic justification for suicide, bombing, hijacking or killing. Read Muhammad, The Life of the Prophet by Haykill. Read Martin Link's biography of the Prophet. Read the ten volumes of Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and you will not see these words being used. It is like some misguided Irish using Catholicism as an excuse for blowing up English people. No monotheistic religion inspires or enjoins killing innocent people. No Islamic declaration of war against the Islamic, the United States of America. As a matter of fact, I did some research and every so-called Muslim majority country has an embassy in the U.S. And just to, just to highlight that, I checked it up on Google to make sure I was correct. <laughs> Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, Azerbaijan, uh, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Brunei, Chad, Comoros, Egypt, Guinea, and the whole list goes right on down to Yemen. All of them have embassies in the United States of America. Except Iran. Except Iran, and that was just closed, what, two years ago? Yeah. yeah. So, the, as I said, the majority of Muslim majority countries, the majority with the exception of this one, I believe, um, has embassies in the United States of America. According to Islam, a country where you have 51 Muslim majority countries with embassies is not considered a belligerent country. 
We have to know this. We have to be aware that what they're saying on the media doesn't add up. They're saying that we are against these people, but we allow them to have an embassy in this country. We have to think, people. We have to be armed with knowledge so that we can deter these lies that are being propagated about this religion. Excuse me. Yes. Why our uh, leader, uh, Islamic leaders don't talk on the TV so that people know the uh, truth? Islamic leaders don't talk on television because television is not interested in us. We have tried. We have written letters. We have asked for press releases. And about all we can get is a sentence that usually is, de is destroyed afterwards because they'll come back with their comments. Oh. We have a hard time buying space in newspapers. So that is why you have to learn this and you have to correct it when you hear erroneous belief. In Islam, the only wars that are permitted are between armies that... And they should engage on battlefields and engage nobly. The World Trade Center was not a battlefield. It was not any kind of noble engagement. Innocent people in a theater is not noble engagement. And it wasn't a last resort. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Do not kill women or children or non-combatants and do not kill old people or religious people. And he mentioned priests nuns and rabbis and he said do not cut down fruit bearing trees and do not poison the wells of your enemies 